Hey everyone, welcome to week 11, our last week with uh, new material. So I hope you had a good weekend and you're um, ready for our last week of uh, new content for this course. We're nearly there. Let's um, move on and get into the um, admin part of this course. Uh, oh, before I say anything more, just want you to know that um, I still have network issues. I spent ages with our with my ISP and with uh, changing hardware and all sorts of stuff. There's some mysterious problem still, so um, I'm keeping a very close eye on it. If it drops out, I, I should be able to recover very quickly now. I think I know how to do that, but um, just bear with me. I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll forge ahead. We'll forge ahead. Uh, right, admin for this week. First of all, there's no labs. Uh, second of all, you should all know that the assignment's due um, at uh, just before the lecture on Friday. Um, like all the deliverables in this course, there's no extensions provided. You just get marked on whatever you had in at that time. So make sure it's in there. Um, it's very important that you take seriously your um, originality and contribution statements. Originality statements, you need to get this right. Um, if you've done something wrong, uh, now's the time to fix it. Okay, um, because if you submit something to this deadline, this final deadline, and you've um, broken the rules, it's really unpleasant because not only will I have to do something about that, but um, your teammates get dragged into it, okay, so, which is really, really horrible. So if you're someone who's done something bad, remember your teammates and remember your own grades and your place in the university. Don't do it, guys. Um, all right, hopefully I've said enough about that. Then, by the way, if you think someone in your team has done something wrong, um, you think carefully about how you want to respond to that. Um, and lastly, contribution statements, terribly important. Some people have told me that they're very worried that some members of the group are not contributing. It's okay for someone not to contribute as long as they accurately reflect that in the contribution statement. So please make sure your contribution statements are accurate. And um, if you're someone who is for whatever reason, not been able to contribute to your fullest in this course, make sure your contribution statement accurately reflects that. And uh, many people have asked, this, this major deliverable that's due this week, it, it, um, if you look at what's due this week, it basically covers the entire assignment. So it's not about what you contributed in the last few days or the last few weeks. It's about what you've contributed to the whole assignment. So if you if you suddenly started contributing vigorously in the last week or so, that may change your contribution statement a little bit, but it's not the, the, the whole picture. The whole picture is everything that gets put in um, for this deliverable. All right. Um, now, the next thing I wanted to point out is uh, for the end of semester exam, what I did was I, um, what I've done is, oops, that's not it. Um, what I've done is I have um, got a sample exam for you. Uh, where is it? If we go to um, assessments here, and then we go to um, final exam here, two things I wanted to point out to you. First of all, this I've just updated all this stuff here and it explains basically how the exam is going to work and you really need to read this okay first of all it tells you when the exam's on the exam timetable was released um, um, last week and so our, that's when our exam is on remember defer to the university timetable not to my course webpage for authoritative stuff but um, that's that's when the exam timetable says it's on it's on at 2 30 on Wednesday the 11th of November and um the, I guess the most interesting thing is this exam will be self-invigilated. Uh, some of you will know about Proctorio, uh, and you'll probably know that most computer science professors don't have a very positive opinion about that sort of technology. Um, what we're doing in it for our exam is it's self-invigilated. And so what that means is you are invited to record the exam yourself on your own computer, and you decide whether or not you want to give that to ANU, and you won't be asked for it unless there's an issue. Okay, so you can just keep that as an insurance policy. And um, if there's an issue, you can tender that as evidence. So it's up to you. Um, it's voluntary. No one is putting spyware on your computer. It's totally up to you. But all the information is there. And um, the good part about that, I hope, is that you will have a sense that you're being protected in the sense that you're in, totally in control of it. And um, and if you're doing the right thing, then this will only serve as, um, as uh, protection for you. And um, like I say, it's 100% under your control. No one's putting stuff on your computer. So go read that if you want. And, and um, well, definitely you want to read it, but you can read it right now if you want. Um, read it in more detail later. And um, 
there's a couple of interesting things here. The stuff that you need to do in advance of uh, the exam, make sure you know how that all the technology is working, which you sure already have. Um, and the only thing you may not have done is check that you've got screen recording software working and you've got a webcam working. And um, then the thing that one thing that's interesting is that um, I'm going to do what I call a technical check, which is basically like a, a trial version of the exam just for a few minutes on the morning of the exam worth no marks at all. And the whole point of this is it gives you an opportunity to check that everything's working and that you can actually um, clone the, the actual exam and you can run a simple test. And the only question in the exam during the technical check will be hello world, like back way back in lab one, which you can easily fill out and complete in just a few minutes. Do the test, make sure it works. It's worth no marks, of course. And then um, do a push and make sure that, that it's correctly pushed to the server. If you can do all that stuff, then it should be the case that you're technically all good to go for the exam, which happens later in the day. Okay. So the idea of this is that if you're having problems with IntelliJ, you're having problems with um, your network or uh, getting to the server or anything like that, that should be ironed out in the morning before the exam. Then when the actual exam happens, um, you'll reconnect to the server and do a pull. And then when you do the pull during the exam time, you'll find that um, the your repo has been populated with all the exam questions. Okay, and all the exam questions will be there and you'll be ready to do the exam. Okay, so when you do the technical check, there'll just be a trivial um, hello world type thing. And then um, during the uh, during the exam, um, uh, at the start of the exam, you better pull and get the actual questions. Okay, and go, go have a read of that. And, and importantly, what I've done here is I've provided the... Uh, exam from last semester. So this is the uh, exam that was run in semester one of 2020. And you'll see here, it's got all the uh, questions that were in that. Um, obviously, I'll set the exam a little bit differently, but roughly speaking, it will be the same. I'll definitely have more variation in this exam. This didn't have as much variation as you did in your mid-semester. So there'll be lots more questions um, in the exam that I set. Uh, you'll see here that where it says A and B, that means these two things are just alternates. Okay. So you, you're only going to do either A or B. You're not going to do both in the actual exam, okay? So these are just alternate versions of that same question. And someone um, in one of the lectures asked about recursion being question one. Yeah, it certainly is in question one, but it's part three, okay? And this is normal. These questions get harder. So that, that, that first one, 1.1 1 .1 is quite easy. 1.2 is a little bit more tricky. And 1.3 is a search question, which is which is somewhat harder, okay? So... Um, please take notice of that fact and please notice that these are not all equal difficulty. All right. Now um, you can go do that. And then in, in the revision lecture, which is coming up later in um, in the schedule, where is it? It's in uh, it's on next Monday in one week's time. If you go to the schedule here, uh, if we go to the schedule, what we'll see here is that the um, we're going to do this revision lecture here in um, Monday. And in that, I'm going to go through the exam. Okay, I'll walk, walk through exam questions with you like I did after the mid-semester exam. But also, you all should... Um, I'll, I'll post a thing on Piazza for you for Monday's lecture next week. But you should respond to that Piazza post once I post it and tell me things that you really want me to focus on in this revision lecture. Okay, so I've only got two lectures left. Today's lecture, um, the lecture on Friday, and then the revision lecture on Monday. Okay, two more after today. And I'm um, just checking, is everyone, I don't see any questions on the um, team site. So I guess things are okay with that or my internet's gone, but I don't believe it's gone. I can see a bunch of people online and I can see the streams happening. So um, I'm just assuming that everyone's just being quiet this morning. All right. Uh, unless there's any administrative questions, no administrative questions at all. I'm going to, no questions. Let me, let me see here. Um, I'm going to post a question here, make sure everyone's actually there. Oh, okay. Julian's responded. Thank you, Julian. I'm glad someone's there. All right. Great. Okay. We're all good. Um, I was beginning to wonder if, <laughs> if there was a problem. All right. The first of the three units we're going to do today is on files, okay, on files. And um, this is a funny thing because uh, we normally think of files as being a, well, traditionally I always thought of files as being kind of bread and butter stuff that everyone understood. Um, but it was someone pointed out to me recently because of the way apps work and the way um, the sort of devices most people grow up with work these days is the concept of a file is kind of disappearing. Um, and uh, so maybe the idea of a file isn't quite as obvious to you, or at least it wasn't as obvious to you before you came and started doing computer science. Um, nonetheless, let's get into, into files. The first thing I want to say is that um, the notion of a file is uh, a, a metaphor, right? Does anyone know what a real file was? And I mean, before computers, does anyone know? You may not have even seen one of these. If you, uh, 
Uh, maybe your parents had one of these when you're growing up. You probably didn't have one. Um, a filing cabinet. So it's a, like a cupboard. You open the drawer and there's all these, these um, bits of cardboard with papers in them. They're called files, okay? It's a way of organizing stuff. Um, and people use this. And if you went to, I don't know, something like a doctor's surgery back in the day, that had these big filing cabinets. And when you walked in, uh, they would um, look up your file and pull your file out and have the information for the doctor. And now, of course, it's just on a computer. But that thing was called a file. And um, the idea of a file in computing is a metaphor for that. So it's a, uh, it's a unit of information, if you like, a, a, a collection of information. All right, now, um, next, um, the first thing you need to understand, which is kind of weird, is the idea of a stream. If, if you've got a mental image of a stream in your head, perhaps, um, and um, you know a stream as in like a um, the thing that water flows down. If you've got a mental image of a stream, um, we use that as the abstraction for files, and I have done for years. Um, now that might seem strange, but the, the, the concept you need to understand, the, the reason for that metaphor is the idea that the stuff just keeps flowing by, right? It's flowing by. This information is flowing by just like the water is flowing by in a physical, literal stream. Okay, um, and, and the way we think of it is it's a sequence of values that are read from the stream or a sequence of values that are written out to the stream. Okay, so you're consuming from the stream as these values come in at you or you're pushing stuff out. So why do we have this metaphor? Why, well, it seems kind of strange. If you think about an array, we just go and get something. Um, it doesn't seem to connote with a stream. There's actually a really good reason for it. It goes back to the basic physics of the way they saw, stored stuff in, the, in, in back in the day. There's a whole interesting history about how information was stored on computers since way back, including things like, bizarrely enough, things like mercury delay lines. Um, anyway, I, I, won't, I won't go there, but what I will go to is stuff that's still um, not so far in the distant past that actually has a huge relevance to the way we do um, uh, file IO. And, I guess some of you will know what this is because they, I think they've, they've become kind of cool again. Um, but this is an ancient technology. And uh, it, in fact, when I was a kid, we still use these. Uh, we use these and, and we'd put our um, favorite recordings on these things. This is a cassette tape, right? We'd record mu music on it and you have a cassette tape player. And um, inside there, there's a reel. Um, and the reel is this is a reel, that's one reel there, and there's another reel there. And then there's this thread, a, a ribbon, if you like, a long, long, long ribbon of very, very thin plastic which with magnetic material on it. And then you had a device which could um, encode stuff on that magnetic tape by, by, by um, recording onto it uh, magnetically. Um, and, an, and another device built into the same piece of equipment that could read the variations in the, um, in, in, in the magnetic field on the tape. And by a bit of electronic magic, what you could do is you could um, you could use that to record and play back music. And, um, and and interestingly enough, you could do it on two sides of the tape, the you know like the left and the right, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and you could put four channels on there, essentially um, um, a left and right uh, stereo. Plus, uh, you could have one side and the other side. And what that meant was you could turn this tape around, and you get forty five minutes on one tape and forty five minutes on the other. All right, everyone got that. So the next question is, um, if I went and put one of my favorite bits of music on here, say an album, um, you could fit two albums on a 90 minute tape, um, roughly. Um, if I put an album album on here and I wanted to go to a particular song, how do I, how would I do that? Right. You, you guys are all used to using, um, your devices for listening to music. Um, and, and, um, um, but, but how do I do it on here? Um, well, if, you, if you've if you got something like iTunes or whatever it might be on your device, um, you can just select a song and start playing it or you can move to a particular point in the song and play it, right? But on this thing, what do you do? Well, you um, need to wind that tape forward to the point where you want to listen to it, okay? And so um, what you'd end up doing is you'd, you'd make these recordings and you'd take careful note on a piece of paper. They actually came with a piece of paper in the plastic uh, packaging and you'd write down there that... Okay, I'm back again. Sorry about that glitch, folks. I saw the uh, Wi-Fi disappear. It's back up. Um, so you'd have to wind forward to the point that you recorded. So you'd write a list of all the uh, songs, where they started, and if you wanted to go to a certain song, you'd wind forward. Okay, you couldn't just jump straight to it. You had to wind. And then when you got to the end of the tape, you take the tape out of the, out of the uh, player, flip it around, and drop it back in again. Okay, and then you, you go from there. 
All right, so that was the mechanism we used for listening to music back in the old days. And um, when people had computers, I, I knew people who had um, computers who were hobbyists who actually recorded their information on these things, okay? Um, some of you will have heard of floppy disk. Well, be, be, uh, before even floppy disk, people had their home PCs record stuff on these things. Um, and uh, that was how we recorded. Notice... The, the, the point I'm trying to make here that, that um, hopefully is sinking in is that to get somewhere, I had to go forward all the way through to that point. I couldn't just instantly jump to the place I wanted to. I had to move forward. And that's the notion of a stream. The stream is the tape going past the read head or the write head. That's the stream. That's where the metaphor of the stream comes from. Okay. Now, tapes uh, continue to be used for a long time. I don't know if you can see what's the, that in the middle there. That thing in the middle is a um, computer that, um, a, a large computer with, a, with with some huge tapes on it, which would, would have recorded a huge amount of information. And the one on the right-hand side is a not-so-ancient picture of... Um, um, DAT tapes, um, high density tapes with a huge amount of information on them. Interesting enough, these things are still used. Um, these things are still used for, for like tertiary storage. So if you want to archive something, it's still a very, very cost effective way to, to, to store stuff. It takes a huge amount of time to get stuff on and off these tapes. And in fact, um, I don't know if we still do, but we used to have a, a tape silo at ANU, which stored absolutely enormous amounts of data because we have astronomers and people like that who um, stream data from their telescopes at a phenomenal rates and they would record the, all this data on these tapes and they had these robotic tape silos where if you looked something up, uh, a robot arm would go and find the correct tape, pull it out of the, the, the appropriate place and pop it into a player and then move the tape forward to the spot where you wanted, uh, where you need to get your thing. It was all automated so you didn't see all that activity, but that's how it worked. And that could store an absolutely colossal amount of information. And still to this very day, um, organ uh, companies like uh, Google and so forth use tapes um, uh, for backups. Okay, because the amount of information you can store on them is still extremely high and they're very cost effective. But hopefully you've all realized two things. One is they're very, very slow. So it's not a great way. Um, it, it takes a long time to find that one thing you wanted. You can't do it in nanoseconds. It's going to take seconds. And second of all, it streams. Okay, so once you start playing that tape, it'll just stream by you and you need to catch it as it streams by. Now, some of you will know what this is. Um, this is a... Um, this is a turntable, okay? This is a turntable, and um, the hipsters among you have probably got one of these. Um, and notice this also has some interesting properties, and it also has this notion of streaming, okay? So if you think about that, the needle, there's a needle there that sits um, here and uh, runs in a groove to pick up um, the the variations in the um, in the in the audio signal, and that and that gets amplified. Um, that needle is going through a long groove. And that groove, if you want, is streaming past the needle. Okay, it's streaming past the needle. Same metaphor, okay? Well, it turns out we do something very, very similar with hard drives, okay, which are still used today. Some laptops still have these things in them. Some computers still have these things in them. And that's what a hard drive looks like. And if you look inside one, you see on the right there um, that there's a disc there. And it's actually very similar in principle to the record. And see that arm there on the record player. If you've actually used one of these, you'll know you lift this thing up and you can drop it on a particular track. Exact same thing over here, except this is magnetic, whereas that one's a physical um, little diamond or something like that running in a groove on the vinyl, whereas this thing here is a little magnetic read head which moves across um, the disc platter here. And typically there'll be multiple platters. This, this might have multiple platters um, stacked up there, whereas here you've just got the one disc. All right. Hopefully, again, I've impressed upon you the idea that there is streaming going on here. Stuff is streaming by. Now, um, in Java, we talk about byte streams. We've got the thing called the input stream and output stream, and they allow you to read streams of bytes. Okay. Now, here's an important and strange thing. You can read a stream of bytes. Um, with these things, you can open the stream. You can read or write to the stream in bytes. That is, read or write some number of bytes. And you must wrap operations in a try and catch clause. Why? Why would you do that? Well, um, you need to do that. You must do that because I.O. is one of these things that can generate exceptions naturally because someone might have pulled the cable out for your USB drive. Someone, there's a, a lot of different circumstances under which a file, file I.O. can fail. Therefore, we um, uh, Java says that for these operations, you have to wrap it in a, um, a try catch clause. Okay? Um, and usually, and we should, it's good practice to use the finally clause to close the stream. Okay, the reason for this is simple. Operating systems on which your Java program will run will only allow you a, a limited number of open files at any moment. 
okay so you have a, a limited number of open files and um um and and um so you don't want to have too many open otherwise you'll uh, uh there we go sorry i just just got a whole stack of uh whole, whole stack of messages on the stream here okay um i'll, I'll catch you up I, I missed a whole bunch of stuff on the chat i'll catch up in a moment uh so you can open um so you want to close the streams. It's really important to close the streams. If you leave too many open, you'll exhaust the number of available files on your operating system. Now, the last line is mysterious. Look at that. It says, ints are used even though bytes are transferred. Why? Can anyone think why that is true? So if you look at the signature, which we'll come to in a little, little bit, it actually gives you an int even though you asked for a byte. Why is that? Anyone? The reason, the reason is there's a single byte has uh, 256 values, right? Eight bits, two to the power, eight to 256, okay? Now you need to be able to signify whether your read or write f succeeded or failed, right? So it's only reading a byte, it just wants to read one byte, but you also need one more bit of information, okay? So you need to get that entire byte plus one more thing. Did it work or didn't it, okay? So now you need one byte plus one extra bit of information. So you need like 257 values, not 256. Okay, because you can't fit 256 values, in, uh, 257 values in a byte, you have to use, what we do is we use an int. Okay, so this is odd. Even though we want a byte, we read an int and then we use a special value, integer value to signify that the uh, file was finished. Okay, so that's a peculiarity and you'll see that when we start running the code. Um, and... Julian, we're going to get to that in a minute. If the if the uh, so there's a question here about um, opening a file causes an exception. Um, would trying to close it in finally cause another exception? Um, the answer the answer that's I think straightforward. I don't have it in my head, but I think the answer is straightforward in the sense that you'll see when we go to write this code um, in IntelliJ, it will tell you you have to wrap um, that in uh, in an exception uh, try catch. Okay, I think we'll see that in a few minutes. So I think your question will be answered then. I'm just going to go and look at the other questions people have had, had on here. Okay, uh, oh yeah, Katrina asked a very good question. What does IO stand for? Input and output. I didn't even say that. I should have said that out loud. Um, all right, and then um, cassette, blah, 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 blah. I'm just looking at the, at the chat here. Uh, forward and rewind to get to your thing. You spin it by hand. Yeah, you put a pencil in the in the cassette tape. Uh, Commodore 64, wow, someone's got memories there. That's the sort of computer some of my friends had. Um, was a tape on that computer considered the main storage? Sometimes, yes, it was. So um, sometimes the only storage you had was this cassette tape. So if you didn't save it to that, then everything was gone when you finished, okay? So there's no disc or anything. Um, and SSDs, I can talk about that later, perhaps. Uh, don't ints use more space? They do use more space, but we're not storing ints. We're just getting ints back, okay? So we're storing bytes, but when the, when the operating system goes to get that byte, it goes to read a byte, and then it gives you, it converts that into an int. It'll either be the value of the byte that it read, or it'll be a special value saying, I couldn't get that byte, okay? So we're not using more space. And ints do use more space in the program, but they're not using more space in the disk, because you're still just storing um, bytes on the disk. Now, before I go on, um, who, uh, this question for the chat here, who here um, likes going to the cricket or the football or anything like that at a stadium? Anyone do that? Am I the only one who does that? I, I go to the football, okay? So one of the problems with the football is in Canberra is that they're hopelessly inefficient, um, in my experience at Monica Oval anyway, um, hopelessly inefficient with running the stalls, okay? So I, I sit there in line to buy a beer or something like that, and I think I spend most of my time in the line thinking about how they could be more efficient. Okay, um, if you go to Melbourne or somewhere like that, they, they, they tend to do things a little bit more efficiently. But what's the problem? Okay, we've got someone who goes to the football or the cricket. All right, what's the problem? Well, okay, um, one of the problems, I, I just want to take a slightly extreme take on things. This is maybe a little bit, a bit, little bit unfair. Um, but for those of you who don't like cricket and football, you can still pay attention because this isn't really about cricket and football. It's really about file IO, honestly. Um, what... Think about this, okay? So if it's a cricket, for sure, you're going to want to keep the drinks cold because we play cricket in summer, right? So you want to keep the drinks cold. Someone's selling drinks, right? They're selling drinks and they want to keep them cold, okay? So, and they've got 20, 30,000 people and they want to sell drinks to 20, 30,000 people. So they've got a huge storeroom with their cold drinks in it, right? Okay? So they've got this big storeroom with all these cold drinks and then they've got a little stand and they're selling the drinks, okay? Now, imagine the stand what happens, you go to that stand and say, um, 
I would like a, a Coke, right? Or a Sprite, right? Or a beer, or whatever it is. I would like that drink. And the person says, sure, just wait a sec. And then they stop what they're doing, walk over to their cold room, which has got the 10,000 drinks in it, grab one Coke, and then walk back to the store, and they give you the Coke, right? Um, that would be inefficient, right? Everyone agree that would be inefficient. Try and, I want you to think about how you make this thing a little bit more efficient than that. You need the huge cold room because that's the only way to store 10,000 drinks, okay? So can anyone think of a more efficient way of delivering the drinks to the customers than the person each time they get an order walking over there? And imagine this, I go there and say, look, I want um, two Cokes and uh, two Sprites, please, okay? And then the person, um, the person says, okay, no worries. And they go to the cold room, come back with one Coke. And they say, and I say, hang on, I asked for two Coke. And they said, yep, yep, I know, I know. And they walk over to the cold room, they get another Coke. And I said, but I also asked for two Sprites. They said, yep, yep, no worries. I'm gonna get that for you. And they go over and get another Sprite and so forth. Okay, this is ridiculous, right? So if they went and got each drink one at a time from the cold room, that would be ridiculous. So what should they do, okay? What they should do is they should have a, yeah, as Ben says on the chat, they should have a small fridge, which um, when there's a, when, when the customers aren't so busy or maybe they've got another person to help them, they fetch a bunch of drinks and put them in the little stand. And then when I ask for two Cokes and two Sprites, they can just reach down and grab two Cokes and two Sprites and give them to me immediately without having to walk all the way to the cold room to get a whole batch. And the person who's getting them from the cold room brings back slabs of them, okay? So that is... So what, what's that concept I just described? Anyone know what we call that in computer science? That I just described to you a concept. Uh, what Ben said on the chat, what Ben said on the chat about using a small fridge, that actually is a concept in computer science. Do you know what we call that? We call it buffering, okay? We're gonna, or, or caching. We call it caching or buffering, okay? So what you have here is a cache of cold drinks, okay? Over in the storeroom, which is a little walk away, you've got this massive number of drinks. You've got 10, 20,000 drinks just to, to keep an entire stadium happy. But in your little tiny store, you've got a cache of them, just enough to, for you to sell them to, to the customers. That is the concept of buffering, and it's entirely relevant to file IO, okay? So when we talk about buffers in file IOs, in Philo, think about the example of the drink store, okay? So, um, now look here, reading one byte at a time is costly. You saw that with my example of the Philo. Now, listen, someone said that's ridiculously inefficient on the chat, absolutely. But you know what? Philo is even more extreme. The, think about the time it takes that person to walk from the drink stand to the cold room, okay? Maybe it's uh, 50 meters away, okay? That is really close compared to the distance between um, for a computer, the relative distance between stuff that's absolutely available to the CPU, stuff that's in memory, and stuff that's in the disk. Okay, let's have a look at this. All right? Does anyone have any idea of what the relative distance is between something that's in the CPU, something that's in the memory, and something that's in the disk? Does anyone know? Well, here's the, here, here are the numbers. To get stuff from a disk takes about 10 milliseconds. And you might think, 10 milliseconds, man, that's really fast. Well, it's not really fast when you compare it to getting stuff from your memory. Uh, RAM is DRAM, it's, it's your memory chips, okay? So look at the difference between 10 milliseconds and 100 nanoseconds. That's an absolutely enormous difference, okay? Uh, milliseconds, um, so from nanoseconds, 10 times uh, that number gives you one microsecond, okay? 1,000 times that takes you to a millisecond, so now we're at 10,000. And then to get to 10 milliseconds, so it's 100,000 times the difference. These two numbers here are 100,000 times the difference. And then to get to a register, that's the thing in the CPU, it's 100 times again. Okay, so it's 100,000 times 100. Okay, there's an absolutely colossal difference between here and here. So if you thought the drink stand was inefficient, that's nothing on the inefficiency of going to disk. Okay, so going to the disk is extremely, extremely expensive. And that's why we absolutely must buffer. Okay, otherwise it's very, very expensive. Okay, oops, uh, where am I? Um, so next slide, um, so there are three standard, uh, okay, so you're all, right in the very first lecture, you started learning about file IO, right? So file IO is um, when you type stuff at the console or when it prints stuff out, when IntelliJ uh, prints stuff out, your Java program prints stuff out. Okay, if you wanna interact with those, they have special names. And these are not about Java, Th these are historical things that go to the way operating systems were built. And there are, there are, there are um, three that we normally consider, okay? And there are three that we're gonna consider in this class. There's the standard input, which is like what you get from the keyboard. 
then a standard output, which is what you normally print out, and then a standard error, which um, in IntelliJ often comes out in red. Okay, and standard out and standard error are very similar, except that they um, have slightly different behavior about how immediately they're presented. Okay, standard output is efficient, and so it might be a little bit more buffered, and standard er error needs to be really prompt because it's really important you get that message. So it's not buffered, so it's a bit more inefficient. Okay, but it's very prompt. Okay, so we th there's the example of the syntax there. We've got we're going to read from the input stream. Okay, so there's a system.read, we get a byte back. Okay, that read function, what does it return? It returns an integer. We need to cast it into a byte, and then we get that, that um, character B, then we can write it out. Then we need to flush the buffer, because if we put stuff into the buffer, we need to clear the buffer out. Otherwise, it will sit in that buffer until we, until we say flush. Okay, so um, with that, we're ready to do the mini quiz. And... Um, we're doing the mini quiz and then we're going to jump into some code. Yeah, the buffer is in is in the RAM. Okay, if we use RAM to buffer. And uh, SSDs usually have built-in. That's right, James. We have, usually have built-in buffers. And disks, hard disks do too. Okay, so there's multiple levels of buffering. But I just want to convey the key concepts there. Um, the exact implementation is um, usually hidden from you to, to, to varying degrees. There's also buffering by the operating system. The buffering we're talking about is the buffering that... that um, that um, the op uh, the Java does explicitly. So now let's g go and write some code. What we're going to do here is we're going to um, we're up to CO four. So create a new package, new um, package CO four like that. And then in here we're going to create a, a, the first file here. We're, hang on, write new Java class. We're going to try create a very simple class that does basic standard file IO file. Um, STD standard IO. Okay. And uh, we're going to add it to Git. Yes, we are. So there's our little simple class. And then we do uh, PSVM, which we've now learned at the, um, off by heart. What we're going to do now is we're going to, first of all, um, uh, read in a byte from the console. Okay. So that's from standard in. Okay. So we're going to read a byte, a byte in from console. So we say byte, just like I had in the slide before. Byte B, that's our byte equals um if so let, let me just do it without the cast first and you'll see the problem here system dot in dot read okay so what that's going to do is it's going to read a byte from stand the standard input okay and why is it complaining um unhandled exception java io exception okay we can get an exception whenever we do file io i mentioned that before so we can add we should add um we can either add an exception up here but we can't do that so what we're going to do is we're going to enclose with a try catch block here hang on more actions there we are surround with try catch there we are so we just we've just surrounded our file io with a try catch so now we're good but look, there's still a squiggly line here. Why have we got a squiggly line now? Let's have a look. What does it say? Cast a byte. Okay. Why Why do we have to cast a byte? Because this is reading an int, which is bigger than a byte. Okay. Now, what we should really do is, probably the, the right way to do it is this. Um, int i equals, there we go. So that works. And then we can say byte b equals byte of i. So we're casting it cast our int into a byte. There we go, like that, all right? And what we should really do is check what the value of that int is to see if, if we actually got to the end of the file. All right, um, what's the benefit? Um, basically, someone asked about what's the difference between the method uh, catching, uh, passing it on versus writing, surrounding it with a try catch. Basically, you're deferring responsibility. You're ducking responsibility, James. That, that, that's, but that's the choice. Okay, so you're either handling it yourself inside the method or you're saying, ah, someone else can handle this and, and say that, um, um, that, uh, someone else can handle this and you're passing it to whoever calls it, then whoever calls your method is going to have to handle it. Okay. So you're passing the buck essentially. So depending on what you're trying to do, that may or may not be a reasonable thing, but that's really what it comes down to, uh, whether you're passing a buck. Um, now, Christina asked, how do we know it's returning an int? Because this always returns an int. Um, and, and, uh, how do I show you that? Uh, um, I, I just explained earlier that, that this returns an int. And um, when I had this as a byte, it complained and said that you can't turn an int into a byte. That's how I knew it was an int. But also I just knew that um, whenever you read, and I explained this earlier, it always returns a, an int, not a byte. Okay, now let's run this program. 
Um, oh, hang on. Let's let's print it out. Obviously, otherwise, we, if we don't print it out, um, then there's not much to look at. So what we'll do here: system dot out dot um. What we'll do is we'll um print it out like that. Okay, so let's just print it out like that and run the program. Okay, so um, let's run this and see what happens. Now I'm going to type the number. Um, I'm going to type the the number five on my keyboard here. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, tell me in the chat what you think is going to happen. I'll, I'll run it. Okay, so I'm going to type the number five. What do you think is going to happen? Let's run this. Okay, it's running. It's compiling it. And here we go. I'm going to type the number five. Let's see what happens. Wow. Okay, what's this all about? Okay, what's going on here? Um, that we've I've typed in a five and I got a fifty-three. Does anyone know why I've got a fifty-three when I typed a five? Anyone know why I got fifty-three printed out when I typed in a character, the character five? I typed five on my keyboard. Okay, you can trust me on that. I got fifty-three. Right. Um, People have already guessed it correctly. Let's go back here because you may have noticed that I had this open just in case. There it is. And if we go here to the ASCII table, okay, ASCII table, this is a Wikipedia page for ASCII. All right, we go here and we'll look up the number five. Where is it? Here it is. Okay. And we'll encoding. All right, there goes my internet again. Okay. Um, the decimal. My, sorry, I got my internet went out for a second there. Um, decimal encoding for five is the ASCII number fifty-three. So what's going on here is we're reading something from the keyboard and it says, "Okay, code fifty-three." Now we we the computer knows. Oh, code fifty-three. That's the picture of that letter five. It's got code fifty-three. Okay, so it's reading back a code that came from the keyboard that says 53. 53 means it's that numeral five. It could have been a different number. Let, like, let's just run it again with a different thing. Okay, and what I'm going to do now is running now. I'm going to press um, shift and five. Okay, so I press shift and five. And of course, that's the percent sign, right? So um, now it says 37. We go back to that table there. And you find the percent sign there, it is 37. Okay, so what it's doing is it's getting a code back from the keyboard. And that code is an encoding of whatever I typed on my keyboard. Okay, and that's the way letters are represented in the computer. Now, of course, these letters here are for the Latin alphabet for, for, for what we use in English. And of course, if you're using a different language, you get different things again, and you won't be able to represent them all on ASCII. Okay, but the point is your computer has to encode the information um, in a special way. So what's happening is we're reading it in one way and we're outputting it a different way. What would happen if I did a write rather than a print line is that it would actually send it back out to the standard out the same way it read it in, which hopefully would mean it would encode it back the same way that it got decoded. Okay, so let's try that instead. Okay, so we'll say system dot out dot write. Okay, so write is the analog to read. Notice I didn't use write a moment ago, I used print line. Okay, so now I'm using write and now we'll do this. What do you think is going to happen now? Does anyone know what's going to happen now? Let's have a look. Now, hopefully, it's going to print five. But will it? Is the big question. Is this going to print five? Okay. Uh, let's do this. I haven't typed it yet. <laughs> All right, I'll try here. I'll type the number five. And what's going to happen? Nothing. Why did nothing get printed out? Does anyone know why nothing got printed out? Nothing got printed out. I gave you a clue in the lecture. There's a good reason why nothing got printed out. That's exactly, of course, what I expected. That was a, that was a, a that was a uh, intentional failure. Why? There's a simple reason why that didn't. Um, no, anyone know? There's something going on here. Think back to the football. It's buffering. Okay, it's buffering that output, and the program ends before the buffer got cleared. Okay, so it's like um like at the yeah, we didn't flush it. Exactly right. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to flush it. Okay. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to go and check what's in the cold room without making sure that at the end of the game, right? At the end of the game, you check what's in the cold room and count up how many cans are in the cold room, but you didn't get the little stall to push all of whatever, whatever it was holding there into the cold room. Or you could think about it with money. Likewise with money at the stall. Okay. You accumulate money. You take money from people. Imagine you're taking cash only, right? You take cash from people. And then you need to put it somewhere in the bank eventually, right? But you might 
put it somewhere safe. If you're taking a lot of money, you might just put it safe periodically. And you need, before you go and count all that money up, you need to make sure none of it's sitting still in the little um, tray in the drink store. Okay, you need to move it out. You need to flush it. That's the word we use. So we'll do the following, system.out.flush. Flush, and we'd run this. And now hopefully the bill will get printed out. Uh, I've got to type it first. There we go. Okay, so all I need to do was to put that flush in here. Without the flush, the program will end before the print happens. Okay, so without the flush. Hopefully that makes sense to you all. Okay, so um, that's the very basics of how you do file I file IO um, uh, for standard input and standard output. Okay. Um, now, there's some questions there. People are asking about um, try catch. I saw that earlier. I'm gonna have to do that in the revision lecture. You're very welcome to put that as a question in the revision lecture. I'll go over that now. Um, how come sometimes you used to have to use a scanner to read inputs, but this time we don't have to. You can do it whichever way you like, but the scanner's a convenient way to read it. The scanner's much more fancy. This is a very, very low-level, grungy way to re read it. We're just grabbing whatever came out of that keyboard. Okay, Tanya? So so when we say file.read on in, um, the in.read, we're just grabbing whatever character came out. If we use a scanner, it's a lot more sophisticated. We can say, give me the next int that came out and so forth. So basically, the scanner is a fancier, more easy to use thing than this. This is the lowest level. Likewise, this, um, the print line is a fancy way to output. Okay, it's higher level if you want to put it that way. Whereas the read and the write are really low level and we're just outputting directly here. We're inputting directly the exact um, encoding that came from the keyboard. And as you saw, that was the 53, which is the encoding for five. And then here we were outputting and we would output 53, but that got encoded as the, uh, ASC, uh, as the character five. All right, now, um, Let's go and write the next piece of code here. What we're going to do now is look at how we deal with files. What we just did there was look at how we dealt with a keyboard and the, and, and the console. Now what we're going to do is deal with files. And um, I've got a new class here, files, files, input, stream, like that. There it is, add to git, yep. And um, we'll create ourselves a simple program like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to open a file that I've already got here. Notice up here, I've got some stuff already here. I've got Hamlet. I've got Hamlet in a dictionary. Okay, Hamlet in a dictionary. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, read stuff in from that file. Okay. And all we're going to do in this example here is read the start of Hamlet. Okay. So first of all, we're going to, we're going to use these streams that I just explained. So file input stream. There it is. Oh, no. What? Oh, I see. That's interesting. So notice how I've, what we want is this guy here, file input stream. Notice I nearly got myself into trouble here. I've called this, this, um, this class I've made for the lecture, I've called it files with an S. And down here is the thing I really want, which is file. Okay. There it is. Notice the difference. That's got no S that has an S in there. Uh, sorry, that has an S in it. There's the S, which is the very crucial difference. Okay, so we're going to use Java's thing called file input stream, and um, we're going to initialize it to null. So there it is. Oops, null. Okay, so we've got a thing called in. We're going to read stuff in from there, and now we're going to say in is equal to in equals new file input stream, and then we'll, we'll give the um, the path here to, the, to this thing here, this Hamlet. Okay, so it's going to be resources. You have to scroll here and you can see resources there. There's resources, um, words, um, Hamlet. Okay, so it's just, just a play. All right, there it is. Now, what's the problem here? It's complaining. We go here and it will say, what is it going to say? It says, do you want to um, surround with a try catch? And we're going to sur surround it with a try catch there. Okay. So what that's what that's doing is it's saying something could go wrong when we try to um, read this. What could go wrong when I read this? There's something very obvious that could, could go wrong here. Okay. What could go wrong here is I could have mistyped that. If I mistyped that, then it wouldn't be able to find the file, and then we'd have we'd have we'd get into trouble. Okay. So um, and so we need to wrap this in an exception so that um, in fact, well, why don't we just do that right now? I think we can, we've got enough here that we can actually um, 
do that just to demonstrate my point. I, I just broke the name. So now the name is not the name we want. And we should um, run this. Where is it run? Now we should see that it, it fails with a um, file not found exception. Okay. And that's because that's because I typed the name wrong. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to read in the first 100 characters for um, int i equals zero, i is less than 100, um, i plus plus, and we're going to um, um, I'll do the same things I did before. Calls in dot read. We're going to read in an int, and then we're going to say b uh, byte. Uh, well, actually, what we can do is we can say, yeah, just to make it really explicit, what I'll do is I'll say this. I'll say byte b equals, equals cast. Oh, of course, I can't call that i because let's just call this j. I've got two i's there. That's the problem. That was why I was unhappy. All right. I can't call that j. And then we'll say i equals in dot read. So we're going to read an integer there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to cast um, that i into a byte. There it is. Okay, so we've converted what the thing we read into a byte. Now, what's, why is it complaining here? Right now, we've got a different kind of exception. Okay, now we've got different ways we can deal with it. Okay, the problem is we, at the moment, this exception is only catching a file not found exception. Okay, but there are other kinds of exceptions that could happen when we do a file read. Okay, so let's just surround it with a to be we've got a number of different ways we could do it. We can make our exception that we've already got there a little bit more general, or we could add an extra try catch, and that's what we're going to do here. Actually, um, let's not do it that way. Um, what we can do, there's multiple ways we can do this, but what I'm going to do here, oops, I'm going to cut that and put it here. Oops, put it here. There we go, catch. So I'm gonna catch it down there. So now we're catching two types of things. I'll get rid of these, these extra lines here. There we go, okay. Oops, what's happened here, catch. Oh, we haven't closed the for loop. Let's close the for loop, there it is, okay. So um, now what's happening is we've got two kinds of exceptions that could happen. One is I've typed the name wrong. The other one is it could be something broken with the file, like maybe someone yanked the disk out, okay. Okay, my keyboard has German symbols too. Yeah, no, it's I'm using a Microsoft keyboard on a Mac, which is just a bad idea. Um, and oh, all right, uh, and I just keep hitting the the uh, special character key by a mistake. All right, so now we've got that. Now we're gonna now we're gonna print that out. System dot out dot out dot right. There it is, like that. Okay, so what should happen here? We're gonna open this file. Then we're going to loop through the first 100 characters and then we're going to print them out to the console. Okay, let's see what happens. Oops, again, keyboard issues. Um, and uh, run this. There it is. Oh, look at this. Hamlet. We've done it. Okay, so what we've successfully done here is open this file, read through in a loop character by character, the first 100 characters of Hamlet and printed them out. Um, okay, I'm out of sync with the chat there, but um, so if there's still a question, maybe you can raise it again because I've, I've lost track of what you're asking me there. Okay, but I've finished this example here. So what we've done is we've read a um, file from an input stream. Now we're going to do, um, now what we're going to do is we're going to do a file copy. Okay, so and with, I think that's the last thing we're going to do with file. Is that it? Uh, no, we're going to do one more thing after that. Okay, so now we're going to do a file copy. Um, new um, Java class, files copy, like that. Add it and um, Actually, I'm going to grab all this stuff here. We just did copy that, paste it into the file copy. There it is. And we're going to read it in, but now we're going to copy it into a new place. Okay. So, so not just, not just going to have an input, but we're also going to have an output file output stream out equals null. All right. And then what we're going to do is going to create a new file here. Remember in that previous example, I read it in, but then I output it to the console. 
Now we're going to read it in and output it to a file. Okay. So now what we're going to say is a new file output stream. And then we're going to give it a name and we'll just call it output.txt. Output.txt. Oops, txt. So we're going to output it to a file called output.txt. Um, and then um, what we can do is we could just read the first, do, let's just do this. We'll just do the first 100 characters. And what we're going to do now is we're outputting, we're outputting to this file. Okay. Now there's one more thing I think maybe some of you raised here, maybe you didn't, is now that if you remember rightly, I said when we're opening a file, we want to close it at the end. Okay. So what we should do is we should close both of them. And I forgot to do that in the previous example. Let's just write that in there. Finally. Um, now what we should do is we should say um, in dot um, close like that. Uh, oops, wrong place. Okay, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong piece of code here. Um, here, that's what I meant to do it down here. Like that. In dot close, and then it's going to say, "Hey, you need to put that in a try catch box." Believe, believe it or not, so we're going to surround that. Okay, so. Um, We've got that. So now we've got a finally clause, which means whatever happens, we want to close this file here, which we opened. Okay. And, um, and that goes, I think to the question, Julie, someone asked James or Julian asked earlier about, um, what happens if we get an exception when we try and do the close? I think someone asked that. Now we're going to go to this copy. And we're going to put the, the same thing in here. We're going to close it and we're going to close both of them. In fact, okay. We're going to say out.close. Okay. So let's go through this. We're going to, um, we've got two files, an input and an output. They're both nothing here. We're going to create them. One is reading from Hamlet. The other one is outputting to a file called output.txt. Then we're going to go through the first 100 characters. We're going to read in a byte and then we're going to write that byte out to the output file. And at the end, under the finally clause, we're going to close both those files. Now let's run this. And hopefully what we'll see is, um, a, uh, copy of Hamlet, but only the first 100 characters. And where is it? There it is there. Okay, let's open it. Ta-da, there it is. So it worked, but only up to the first 100 characters. Let's go back to our example now and change it. Where are we in here? Yep, now let's change it to read all of them. How do we do that? We need to write a while loop that will stop once there's nothing more to read. Okay, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna say while, um, instead of doing that, we're gonna say while can make this shorter while, um, and, and in fact, what we should do is we'll put the int here, int i equals zero, like that, we'll put that in front, and we'll say while i, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an assignment inside a while loop condition, while i is in dot read, right, so we're going to read a byte, and we're going to, oops, should be an equal sign there, okay, so we're assigning in dot read to i, and then what we're going to do is compare that um, with minus one, which is the way we identify the end of file. Okay. So if we're going to go through this loop, assign a new value to I, and as long as it's not minus one, we'll keep going. If it's minus one, it means we're done. Okay. So now we can just get rid of all of this stuff here. Uh, there, we can just do this like that. Okay. So now we've got a while loop where, um, Converting that that i into a byte. Okay, we've we've take, taken care of the case where the i was minus one, which means the end of file, and then we're outputting that to our file. And let's see what happens. Let's run this file copy. Okay, and it's finished. And let's go to the output file, and there's the whole of Hamlet. Okay. All right. So we've copied files. Now the last thing we're going to do is um. Right. Um, you still, uh, okay. I'm not, I'm not following all, all your chat. It's kind of hard to follow all that while we're, uh, while I'm coding. If you have a specific question for me, please just call it out so I can see that you're actually asking me a question by all means, continue your discussion. It looks, looks like you're asking good stuff there. What we're going to do now is we're going to copy this thing here. Oops. Hang, hang on a sec. Um, and a copy. And then we're going to paste and we call, and now we're going to look at buffering, which is the point we raised before. Okay. So, um, what we're going to do now, we're going to call files buffering, buffering. Okay. And we're going to add it to Git. And now we're going to have two variations on this and, oh, and because we're going to do some real measurements, we're going to write a, uh, going to do this multiple times. So for, um, 
int um, j equals zero, um, j is less than 20, j plus plus. Okay, so we're gonna in in capture this entire thing in a great big loop here. Right, and um, so we're gonna repeat the experiment 20 times and we're gonna actually do an experiment here. And um, one of the things we're gonna do here is create a timer, which we're gonna use a long, a long value, long start equals zero, okay. And in a minute, we're gonna get the, an exact time and put that into start, and at the end, we'll get the exact time, and the difference will be the time it took to do the copy, the file copy, okay. And we're gonna run that experiment 20 times, all right. So now, we're gonna write a, um, we're gonna put this uh, in, a boolean here. We're going to turn this into false. We're going to turn this on and off. We're going to have two different ways of doing it, okay? In and out like that. So that's the way we just did. And then the other way to do it is with buffering. So now let's write in here. In the other case, we do exactly the same stuff here, except we're going to use buffered versions of the same things. And then you can see the difference between buffering and not buffering, okay? Um, and so what we'll say is new buffered input stream. There it is, buffered input stream. And it takes as an argument all that same stuff. So it's kind of wrapping it up in a buffer. Uh, why is it complaining? Method call expected, what have I done wrong here? Oh, uh, sorry, that equals new. Like that, okay. And what's happened here, why is this complaining? Required buffer input stream. Um, I know what's happened here, is I need to use the parent type here, like that, okay? So I'm gonna change this to be the parent type, like that. So both file input stream and buffered input stream are both of the type input stream, okay? So now this this works, and now, now we say new buffered output stream, like that, and then we wrap all this up. Okay, so what we've done here is, and what, we're gonna, what we can do is we can say how big the buffer should be. So let's just make it a particular size. That's no, two to the power uh, 11. Right, we can make it any number we want really, but let's just make it that number there, okay? So now what we've got is depending on what this, this Boolean is, either we'll do it the way we just did it before, which doesn't use buffering, or we'll do it this way, which use a buffer of that size, okay? And then what we need to do is need to time it, okay? So now we'll say start, equals system dot nano time uh, like that we're gonna get the number of nanoseconds and then at the end of the of the thing right down after we close it which is when everything's flushed out we're gonna say um, we're gonna print out what we got system dot out dot print line um, like that and we'll say um, that took um, and then we'll say um, the current time minus the start time, and then we'll multiply to make it not nanoseconds because that'll make it really hard to read if it's nanoseconds. So we'll say um, uh, system dot nano time, which is the time now, right? Minus the start time, which was the the nano time when we started. So that's the difference. And then we want to divide that by some. Um, let's divide it by a million to convert from nanos to millis. Okay. So you want to. Uh, um, if you just write nanoseconds, there'd be lots of zeros at the end. Well, it'd be a very big number at least. Um, so let's just do that. So divide it by um, one, two, three. And my Wi-Fi is gone again. Drop out again. Okay, I'm back up again, I hope. All right. Um, so we divide it by a million. And then we'll say um, plus... Um, that many milliseconds. All right, so now let's run this, okay? And um, what you should see is, um, okay, so now this is without buffering. All right, it's taking pretty much the same time every time we run it. Can you see that? All right. Um, so there you go. So it's taking about seven um, 100 milliseconds to do that entire file copy. Yep, okay. 
Yeah, I'm just going to plow on, folks. I know it's dropping out. I can see it drop out, but it's normally taking only about two or three seconds for me to bring it back up again. So hopefully you're not getting too much of a of a, of, a, of an interruption, and I just apologize for that. At the moment, there's nothing I can do all right, um, about that. Um, all right, so we've done that. Now let's turn this Boolean to false. So now we use buffering. Okay, notice the numbers here, right? So it's nearly 700 milliseconds. So it's just a, frac a large fraction of a second. Let's run it now. And look at that. Look at the difference. Not only did it, is it much, much less, okay? Not only is it much, much less, but it's getting faster as we do it more times. Okay, so that's the first time we read it, then the second time, third time, and soon it's down to one millisecond. Okay? Um, if you want, we can, because this is this um, is faster, this computer's faster than the one I used last year. Let's change it to microseconds. Okay, so I just dropped a thousand off of that. Let's just see how many microseconds it is. Okay, so it's it's just it's just a, um, a bit over a millisecond. All right, now what we can do just to make this a little bit more interesting is we can change this buffer size according to which iteration it is, and we can just say one like that, and what that's saying is one uh, two to the power j. All right, so um, that's what that's doing, it's saying one and then shift it by whatever j is. So um, if j is zero, it's um, one shifted by zero, which is one. If j is uh, one, it's one shifted by one, which is two. If j is three, it's one shifted by three, which is um, four and so forth. So it's two to the power of that number. Okay, and um, let's run it now. And you should see the effect of different buffer sizes. Okay, and you'll see here that it starts off here at um, nearly one second, right? So it's 900 milliseconds. Let's just go back to milliseconds. You didn't really need the microseconds. Okay, so change it to milliseconds again. One, two, three and run it again. Okay, and see down here, it's actually less than less than a millisecond. Okay, so it's not really zero milliseconds, it's just less than a millisecond. Okay, somewhere in between a millisecond and a microsecond. Anyway, you can see that as the um, buffer size gets bigger, we're getting faster and faster. So that should emphasize the value of buffering. And you can see here that the buffering is just like um, the beer stand. Obviously, the person can operate better if they have a bigger cache of drinks in their little stand. That's what the buffer is like. So you put more there, it makes it faster. Okay. And in the worst case, this is the one here when they're getting each thing one at a time, it's taking, you know, it's taking a thousand times longer, right? The difference between that and that is about a thousand times different. Okay, it's a thousand times slower. And with that, we're ready to move on to the next part of the course. Um, the next part is computational complexity, and that actually relates to what we just did, believe it or not. Um, so context is key computational resources. Now, what are the two key computational resources, folks? I just gave you a big clue just then, right? How do we make that program get faster? How do we make it get faster? There was a cost associated with it. It wasn't a big cost, but there was a cost. What was the cost of making it get faster? Anyone? The cost of getting it faster was space. We needed to provide a buffer, okay? So we provided a buffer and that cost space. Yeah, using memory, exactly, right? So we're using space to buy speed, okay? We're buying speed with space. And think about it with the drink stand, the bigger the bar fridge or, or, or thing where the, inside the little stand is, the bigger that is, the more you'll be able to deal with drinks quickly. If you had just space for six drinks, that's going to be really annoying because you, every time you sell six drinks, you have to go get more from the cold room, right? Whereas if you had a thousand drinks, then you don't need to go to the cold room until you've sold a thousand drinks, right? But having a fridge that holds a thousand drinks uh, takes up space compared to the one that holds six drinks. Okay, so there's a trade-off between speed and space. You can make, very often in computing, you can make things faster if only you had some more space. All right, so time and space are two of the key trade-offs. The other thing we can do is sometimes with energy. We're not gonna discuss energy in this class, but I wanted to highlight it for you because that's one of my research areas here is the, t the, the energy efficiency of computing and how we can, we can use energy to buy time and how we can make things more energy efficient by being clever with time and space. Okay, so understanding the energy impact is also really, really important. And so it's another resource we care about. Okay, so these are computational resources and they're ones that we care about that we want to preserve. So um, um, now, I'm just gonna put something away that I didn't wanna put away. 
here it is. Um, this is what we're going to study next. Okay, yeah, all right. So um, computational complexity is a study, like a formal study of how we understand the size of a problem, how it affects the resource consumption for a given implementation. Now, let me try and give you a sense of what size of the problem means. Imagine you're in a, um, you, you, it's, um, I don't know, a small group of you, there's, there's five of you. Okay, and you've got to all find out, you don't know any of the other people, right? There's five people there. And um, you've got to all find out um, the um, whether you share a birthday with each other, okay? And the rules of the game are in, in, in these circumstances, you can only talk to one person, They can't, no one can hear what each other says. So basically two of you at a time will exchange information. Okay, so two people at a time will exchange information, everyone else doesn't know. So how do, how do you find out who, um, exactly who in that room um, uh, shares a birthday well it means that everyone has to exchange birthdays with everyone else um, okay and so under the rules of that that very silly game the rules are that um, no one can hear what anyone else says so each person has to go to each other person and that way you find out how many um, people share a birthday so what that means is for each person they have to talk to all the other people and every person has to do that so it's what we call n squared Okay, it means that the number of exchanges of information is roughly equal to the square of the number of people involved. Okay, for every person, they've got to speak to roughly every person. They've got to every person minus one. Okay, so they've got to speak to roughly every person. Every person has to do that, so it's n squared. Okay. Um, so uh, what, now the, when I talk about the 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 the, um, the problem size, think about the example I just gave you. Think about that, that, that the problem I just gave you. Now imagine if that was a group of six people. It wouldn't it'd be slightly annoying to do it that way. But n squared on six. What's n squared on? What's 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 six squared? Okay. In fact, it's going to be six times five. It's going to be um, n times n minus one in that particular example I gave you, which is going to be six times five, which is thirty. Okay. So it's going to be thirty exchanges of information in that very silly example I gave you. Now think about it. If you're in the lecture hall and there's four hundred people there, then it's going to be four hundred times three hundred ninety nine. Okay, 400 times 399, huge problem. Okay, so things have exploded. Now, if you've watched the news in the last year, you will have heard lots of media commentators talk about exponential growth. Often they have no idea what they're talking about, um, but the, the point is that things can grow at rates that are non-linear, okay? And exponential growth is one example of that, okay? And the example I just gave you there was what we call quadratic growth because things are growing with a square law, okay? And that is an analysis of a very simple problem. I gave you a very kind of slightly ridiculous problem and showed you how that problem changes as we um, uh, grow the number of people. Can anyone think about any other problems that we might want to study this way? Ones that we've done in class. Um, okay, uh, sorry. Um, and I'll, I'll go onto the slide here. We, we analyze this two different ways. One is worst case complexity. So that, that's the... Um, worst case for a given size n, but also the average case, okay? In this class, we're gonna look at the average case. The worst case is actually very important under certain circumstances. Like for example, I do some work with real-time systems and you're always studying the worst case because you want to be sure that um, your computer can find the thing you want. Yeah, sorting is a great answer to the previous one. Um, Fibonacci is a good one too. Um, what, what you want to be able to do here is um, you want in, in real-time systems, you need to be able to guarantee the worst case behavior. Um, because you don't want your airplane to crash, you want to know that the computer can return a result in less than one millisecond or whatever it might be. So it's always the worst case. The average case doesn't help you if your plane's about to crash. Okay, so, but in this class, we're going to look at average case. And um, so how do we do this? Well, we identify N, the number which characterize the problem size. And in the example I just gave you, N would be the number of people in that group who are exchanging birthdays, okay? And um, another example might be the number of pixels on a screen, the number of elements to be sorted. Um, Adam talked about sorting as an example. It's a great example. Um, and then what you need to do is study the algorithm to determine how resource consumption changes as N goes up, okay? So we wanna work out how resource consumption, which could be time or space, how that changes as N goes up. And in the example of the birthday thing, the dominant thing there is how many exchanges are there, right? If everyone's got to ex exchange with everyone else, you do that and you see it's n squared. It's very close to n squared, okay? So um, now big O notation, some of you have already studied this in other classes. Um, for some of you, this will be completely new, that's okay. Um, it's a notation that says that uh, allows us to uh, formalize this, the, the 
our approximation of the behavior of these things, okay? And the way we do it is we say, it's, it's basically take an approximation. So if you look at that black curve there in that graph, or is it black or blue? I think it looks black on my screen. That black curve there, um, right above my head, um, that black curve is perhaps the performance, perhaps with respect to time. Imagine that um, N is the bottom axis, the, the X axis, and Y is some resource, perhaps time and it shows you how much time it takes to solve that problem. And notice in this particular contrived example, it's not smooth, right? It's got a bump in it for whatever reason, right? There's all kinds of reasons why that might be true. And what we're, what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna work out a way to characterize the basic behavior of the function g, okay? The basic underlying behavior. And the way we do that is we say it formally, what's written on the screen there. Um, um, we've got a constant C, so you said there's F of N with a constant C. The constant C is um, uh, a multiplier on the function N, a uh, function F. And um, and then also we wanna make sure that that function matches for some value um, beyond um, N sub zero, which is shown there on that line, which is a way of saying we're gonna ignore those um, early wrinkles in the startup of this thing and we're more interested in the steady state behavior that is how things happen in the long run as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you can see here that c and g are very similar and in fact if you kept making this graph go on and on and on and on and on say made it go on a thousand times as big as what's on this graph you'd find if you looked at the big picture c uh c of f and g would be exactly the same shape because you wouldn't be able to see that distance because that distance would shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and if you shrunk it a thousand fold you wouldn't even notice those two lines were different okay and that's the basic point here okay so what we need to do is find out that shape what is the shape that fits our function in this case our functions g some function and we're going to need to find this this shape which best matches it okay and there are some examples here. One is constant, okay? Um, so uh, constant time is one. Um, and so what's an example of something that's constant time? Anyone? Constant time. So can anyone, what I'm gonna wait to do on the chat here uh, is mention for any of these things here, how many are there? Uh, there are uh, five things here. For any of these things here, give an example of something that matches this level of complexity. All right. Um, Adam says a hash map. Not quite, Adam, um, for constant time. It's not quite a hash map, a hash function, right? Hash function should be constant time. Okay, it depends though. You can make a bad hash function, but most hash functions will be constant time. Okay, so uh, a constant time. Oh, oh, sorry, the behavior of a hash map should be constant time also. You're absolutely right, Adam. So the access, the read, so the, 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 the um, a well, a well-shaped hash map should have constant time access, okay? Um, and Lewis has pointed out exactly that uh, the access to an array is constant, it's O1, okay? If you want to read an element from an array, it's definitely O1, okay? Um, what about um, any of the other ones? Anyone got any other examples? Okay, I've got some prepared here. Okay, so the time to perform an addition, that always takes the same amount of time on a given computer, okay? Um, Logarithmic is the time to found, find an element in a ba balanced binary search tree. Okay, so you want to find something in a balanced binary search tree. It the the it's equal to on average the height of the tree or half the height of the tree. Okay, the height of the tree, and if it's balanced, if it's balanced, the binary search tree will have a height of log n. If it's not balanced, it's a different thing. Okay, if it's not balanced, then it could be in the worst case be n, which is linear. Okay, so. Time to find an element in a balanced binary search tree is log n, but the time to find an element in a completely unbalanced binary search tree would actually be n, because you've got to step through n things on average before you find it. Which is what um, the next one says, the time to find an element within a linked list, on average, it's gonna be half of the length of the list. So it's in, in the order of n, okay? So it's in the order of n. Um, n log n uh, is an example of merge sort. And here we have, um, people have suggested a whole bunch of things on, on the chat here. Order n is to search a linked list, exactly, Linda. And um, yeah, we've got a hash map for constant, um, n log n for, an f uh, for a fast Fourier transform, and a bubble sort is quadratic. n log n is for a merge sort, perfect. Um, and for a loop like that, it's order n. Yeah, great. Very good, guys, or n girls, everyone. <laughs> um, and the quadratic one, it was an example I gave you before with the birthday exchange, okay? So, um, 
one way to do this to analyze a piece of code, a very simplistic approach that you can use is that um, you can simply count the number of statements that would get executed. Um, the problem with this is that simple statements are constant time and library calls could be arbitrarily complex. So this is a very simplistic approach, but it gives you a little bit of intuition for how it works, okay? So this is not a great way to do it, but it gives you a sense of how the thing works. So let's go through this example. Okay, so if we want to hash into a table of n elements, and Adam has mentioned the hash table, okay, a hash function like this one here, the operation there is just an integer remainder operation, okay? That's, that's what's going on there. And so that's constant time, because you're just doing one operation, which is integer remainder, okay? Um, and then if you want to sum up a list of size n, which is a sum operation, then um, that's going to be as um, someone just said just right then, or it's almost exactly what they said then, that's going to be order n, okay? And then a more complicated one, this is the minimum difference between a set of values, okay? So there's some set of values you want to find, what is the smallest difference between all the things? Very much like the birthday problem, okay? Um, so now what you're going to say is, um, we're going to say this assignment is just cost one. Okay, this loop, the whole loop, the, all the code inside the top of the loop will get executed n times, right? So that plus plus, that addition will happen n times. So the complexity of that plus plus operation and those comparisons is n. Okay, um, now if we know that n minus one plus n minus two plus and so forth down to one is equal to this, that's just a little bit of math for you. If you happen to know that, then you would know that the, com the number of times this function gets executed is n minus one times n divided by two. Okay, and the same is gonna be true for each of the lines inside of here. Okay, now if you add them all up, what you get is the following, two n squared minus n plus one. Okay, that's the complexity if you simply take this simplistic approach, which is in the order of n squared, which goes back to what I said to you before with the exchange, exchange of birthdays between people in a room. That's how many comparisons there would be, which is basically what you got, got here, okay? Time for the mini quiz. Um, where are we? Publish the poll. Okay, there's the mini quiz. And now what we're gonna do is actually look at some examples with this complexity using um, some actual code. We're not gonna write very much code, but we're gonna look at some examples. Um, so stuff I've already put here for you in advance. What I've done is I've taken out the set that we built and there's two sets, right? The binary search tree set and the hash set. Now I want you all, while I start writing this stuff, to think about the behavior of the binary search tree and the behavior of the hash, of the hash set, okay, the hash table. We've got a hash table, which we use to implement the set, and we've got a binary search tree, which we use to implement the set. Think about, think about um, how they behave, and think about the discussion we had in class about the worst case scenarios for them, all right? I want you to think about that. Now let's look, let's get rid of these files here so you can see more clearly what's going on. <clears throat> what we're gonna do here is, I've got, a little function here. I've written a little very, very simplistic JavaFX thing. It does plotting. It's terrible. It's really bad. Don't don't um, copy it. Or oh, you can copy it, but I, I don't recommend it. And what we're going to do here is <clears throat> um, I've written some code. You can go and read all this. I'll, I'll, I'll put it up on, 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 on GitLab later. But um, all it does is it's got um, a, a list of words. There, there's your list of words. Um, and we're going to read them in from... Um, we're going to read them in from the dictionary, I think. Yep, we're going to read them in from this dictionary over here, which we use the same dictionary we use for Boggle. We're going to read them in. And then what we're going to do is um, put all those things into, um, uh, we're going to create a new XY plot. And then we're going to um, show that plot. And what we're going to do here is run two things. We're creating a, a binary search tree set, which is the one we wrote in class. I just copied the code over. We wrote this in A04, I think. Let me have a quick look. Where did we get it from? Yeah, there you go. A04 is where we wrote this code. We wrote this code there. We're going to put all those words into the binary search tree. Okay, so I've written some code, which you can look at later, which puts all our words in the binary search tree. Right? Think about what's going to happen when I do that. <clears throat> And it's gonna do that with different numbers of words, which means that we can look at n changing on our um, n changing on our x-axis. And then time will be on the y-axis. So we're gonna get a graph where the x-axis changes the number of words and the y-axis uh, measures how, how long that took, all right? 
And so, um, get rid of these things here. Um, so what we've got here is the, um, and we're going to do the same thing with a hash set. So we've got a, a binary search tree implementation and a hash tree implementation. Then after we've done that, we're going to do a something which does a different operation, which looks to see whether our set contains the value we want. Okay, so this is putting something in the set, that's adding something to the set. This is <clears throat> just checking to see whether the thing we want is in the set. It's a set operation and just checks to see if it contains it. All right. Now think about what you're expecting to see. Does anyone, anyone want to um, suggest on the chat what they might, what we might see here? Let's run it and have a look. Okay. Let's have a look, and you can tell me if this is what you expect. It's running, and now it's going to be. Oops, that's annoying. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's kind of annoying. Let's put it on a different window. All right. So that contains. There's a populate in this that contains, and let's go back to this here. Um, so for populate, okay, so we've got cyan, which is blue, uh, light blue is for the binary search tree and gold is for the hash. And we've got populate and contains. Let's go back to here. So populate, look at that. What shape curve is that? What shape curve is that purple thing? Right. My internet's gone again. All right. All right, I'm back online and Adam, great thinking. Think about these graphs here. If, if you're um, looking at the chat, you can see that Adam has made some observation about the behavior of the binary search tree. Okay, good. So remember, let's just go back what colors were which I've already forgotten. The gold is the hash and the cyan is the um, binary search tree. Now listen, look at this. This is really strange. Um, the hash is worse than the binary search tree. The hash is worse than, worse than the binary search tree and contains the same things going on here. What on earth is happening? Can anyone explain why the hash table is performing so poorly? Can anyone explain? Can anyone explain that? Just so we see, first of all, the cyan looks okay, but um, <clears throat> let's just actually, let's just get rid of the hash. Let, let me just focus on one thing at a time. Um, Let's just look at the, let's just look at the binary search tree first. We'll do one thing at a time and stop that and start it again, run it again. There it is. I'll run this again. So we're running it again. <clears throat> and now all we're looking at is the, um, that's a bit of a mess, but um, what we're seeing there is something that does not look like uh, it's contains and that's populate. Okay. This is not what you expect, expect for a binary search tree. Okay, and why not? Okay, well, I think the answer is what Adam just pointed out. The problem is our binary search tree. Look at this populate. Okay, this populate is crazy. Okay, you expect with the binary search tree to populate to be log in, but it's not log in at all. Okay, so we've got some very bad behavior. We've got an outlier here for some reason. So this is noisy data. You'd have to run it a few times to get the result, but the, to get a clean result. But something very strange is going on here. Basically, it's it's way more expensive. And the answer is what Adam just said here. So how can we solve that? Anyone know how we can solve that? Adam points out that the dictionary is already sorted. If the dictionary, well, normally dictionaries are. Let's have a quick look. There it is. Okay, the dictionary is already sorted. There's our dictionary, <clears throat> and it's already sorted. So the problem is, if we put that into a binary search tree, everything is going to go down one side and our binary search tree isn't a tree anymore. It's a linked list and that's going to be really bad. Okay. So um, what we want to do is we want to, um, is to shuffle that. Okay. So if we shuffle that, so let's just try and shuffle it. Turns out that I have already implemented a method for shuffling. So what we can do is we can do this, you know, words equals um, shuffle like that. Okay, and then, oops, and then we can do it again. Um, copy, paste, we'll run it again now, and we'll make that blue. Oops. Okay, and now um, let's have a look at our graphs. Run it again, stop that, run this again. Yeah, randomly shuffle it, perfect. It's exactly... Now you can't even see, oh, the contains only has the sign. But what, oh, that's not what we expect. 
what has happened there. Maybe this is too, um, I'm going to comment that out because I think that is distorting what we're doing here. Let me just try this again. Uh, all right. Oops. I'll just make this bigger. Um, let's make it 10 times bigger. All right. Run it again. Well, that is not looking the way I, I wanted I wanted it to. What's going on here? Let me see if I made a mistake here. Words equals shuffle words. That is not what I expect to see. Let's just look at the list. This should be good. It seems like it's actually just behaving more randomly than I expected. Okay, so this let's just try and run this a few more times. I'm this is not how it, it's supposed to behave. Why is it behaving like this? I'm I'm actually at a loss. All right, mate, the, what you can see here is actually really, really random, okay? And I don't quite know why. What you should be seeing is a nice flat line for that. All right, marvelous. So this is not behaving the way I expect it to. Let's move on and do the hash table. Maybe I'll figure that out in a minute. I'm still a little confused about that. Populate BST, populate BST. Oh, um, is it because I have not, um, I need to create a new set here. Will that make the difference? Let's just see if this fixes it. I think that's what I've done wrong. Let's just see. Nope, that's not doing it either. Okay, I don't know. Let's just move on. Um, I don't know what happened there. I expect I did not expect it to behave that way. So what we're going to do is comment those guys out for the minute. That was a not how I expected it to behave. Let's look at the hash instead. Let's go back to the hash. Okay. So people said quite correctly that they expected the hash to be constant time. Now let's have a look at it. Let's run it and see what we got here. Oops. It's taking a long time. Maybe this is too big. Let's go back to this. Wow, this is not working so well. Try again. <clears throat> okay, this contains. And there's populate that does not look like constant time okay we expected to get constant time for populate and contains why are we not seeing constant time anyone know why we're not seeing constant time our hash table should be giving something something like constant time does anyone know why okay well the answer is let's have a look at the code hash set Okay, the problem is the number of buckets, <clears throat> the number of buckets that we've got for our hash set is only two. Okay, no, the hash function's fine, but we've only got two buckets. And what is a hash table to generate into when we've only got two buckets? Okay, what is a hash table to generate into when you've only got two buckets? It degenerates into a linked list or two linked lists. Okay, so um, what I've done is I've added an extra method here, which allows us to create one with a particular of a particular size. So here I've added this, this constructor here, which allows us to create hash tables with different sizes. And now we can explore what happens when uh, we do that. So let's just go back to IntelliJ, stop that. And what we're going to do here, oops, wrong one, complexity, we're going to go down here, and we're going to um, create hash sets of different sizes. Um, and what we can do is we can say size one, size one, and then um, what we're going to do here is 
size. Um, what we would do 20, say 20 buckets, and then we'll do it again with, um, say, um, 1000 buckets. Okay. And we'll give them different colors. We'll give them orange and red. And do the same thing here. Orange and red. And this will be uh, 20. And this will be 1000. And let's see if we can see a difference in these ones, even though we didn't manage to get that for the for the BST. I'm not sure what's going on with my computer. Okay, we're now doing three times as much work, so it might take a little bit longer to, to, to produce these graphs. There you go. Okay, so look here at these curves. This is what I was hoping I'd, you'd see at the, the previous one. So now you see a nice curve like this, right? A very nice curve like this. And then that's the gold one, right? Which is really bad. And that's because that it's putting things into a into a two just two linked lists or one linked list because the hash table's only got one entry in the table. The orange one has 10 hash um, uh, entries in the hash table and the red one has got a thousand. And you can see that the red one is basically constant time. So no matter how, no matter what N is, um, we're getting constant time to put an element in. Um, and likewise for contains, to find out something is in there, it's basically constant time, no matter what N is. All right, so um, again, and here you see very nicely linear behavior. And here you see, um, this is probably n squared because um, you have to do it. What is that? Um, to populate, you first have to check, then you have to add it. Okay, so I guess that's why it's taking longer because it always goes to the end of the list. Um, and um, all right, so hopefully that has made it very clear to you the importance of the size of your hash table in the performance of the hash table. Um, and, and, and illustrate it to you very clearly. I'm going to go back and look at the BST thing later, not now, because um, we need to finish the lecture. But um, the so the BST thing didn't illustrate what I wanted to, to show you, and that is that the ordering of the input data affects greatly the um, the performance. But um, now we're going to move on to the next section, which is the second, very nearly the last section in the entire class, and we're going to look at formal grammars. So hopefully you all did some uh, grammar at school. And no matter which language you learned, you will have learned about grammar at school. Okay. Um, and uh, the first thing I want you to think about is um, the difference between um, languages. Okay. You all know about formal languages. Can anyone think of an example of a formal language? A formal language is a one that is synthesized. It's not a, not a natural language. So we normally think in terms of formal languages and natural languages. Spoken languages like English um, and um, Hindi and uh, uh, Chinese, they're all natural languages which evolved over a very long time. Okay. But formal languages are ones that are generated synthetically. Okay. And um, what we're going to we're only touching on this very briefly here. So, this is, so if you're doing 1600, you're probably doing this more in a lot more detail than what you're going to do in this class. This is just a very, very um, superficial touch on formal grammars. But I'm going to introduce to you Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky is a very interesting character, um, and um, he's 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 well known as a um, political commentator, but he's also a very influential in linguistics and also in computer science. Um, because of his um, work on formal languages. So um, he's often credited with opening up the field of formal grammars while he was studying natural languages. Now, um, if you think about uh, grammar, for, for, for example, for English, we can think of a, a sentence as containing a noun phrase and a verb phrase, possibly followed by another noun phrase. And a noun um, could be something like uh, signs and directions and lives. That could be nouns, lives, I mean. And then um, article is the, and a verb could be show, matter, and look. There's three verbs. An adjective, big, small, black, white. Okay. Then a noun phrase um, is going to be an article, an adjective, a noun, followed by possibly a noun phrase. And then um, a verb phrase is going to be a, um, <clears throat> um, a verb followed by a noun phrase. 
okay? Now, uh, an op optional noun phrase. So now adjective is black, a noun is uh, lives, okay? So black lives, okay? And we've got a, a noun phrase, which is black lives, okay? So black lives, uh, black is the adjective, lives is the noun, okay? And the verb is matter, okay? So there's a message here. <laughs> and then your verb phrase is, um, is that verb there so it's a verb phrase and you've got a sentence so now you have a sentence which is composed of a noun phrase which has an adjective which is black a noun which is lives um and then um you've got a verb which is matter okay so you've heard that slogan and you can understand um that it's composed there's a grammar there which explains in english how that sentence is constructed okay but um the the um and the, 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 the sentence on the left here is also a, um, a sentence that you can make up with this grammar we've just described here, okay? So you've got an article, the, you've got um, um, a noun, science, and you've got show is the verb, and the is an article, and directions is a noun, okay? So we've now got two different sentences which are made up from this little grammar we've explained here, okay? Now, um, small big directions matter the black white signs. That sentence there is also a legal sentence. Notice that the second sentence makes no sense at all. Okay, so our grammar is not about whether the thing is uh, doesn't tell us anything about the meaning because that second sentence has no meaning at all. It's not meaningful in English. The first sentence is meaningful. The second sentence has no meaning. Okay, um, so you can make a syntactically correct correct sentence but it that doesn't con contain any meaning i tested positively towards negative i think that was a trump said that didn't he i tested positively towards negative something like that all right um so hopefully it gives you the sense that we have a grammar okay and rules for producing um a sequence of words okay and we can follow those rules and still produce things that have no meaning in them okay so this grammar does not dictate anything about the meaning. Again, we saw an example there of a legal sentence which has absolutely no meaning because it makes no sense at all. And then another one which is also legal that does have meaning, okay? So when we talk about these grammars, we're not talking about meaning, we're talking about structure, okay? And what we just saw there is a grammar in English, okay? That's an English grammar. And different languages have different grammars. Some grammars are more complex with more exceptions. Other ones are more simple. Um, now, EBNF is a standard way of representing the syntax of a formal language, but not the semantics. Semantics is the meaning. Remember, the grammar tells us this about how the syntax, that is the organization of those words, how that works, the rules for how you can organize those words, but it says nothing whatsoever about what it means. Okay? And the way uh, EBNF works is with terminal symbols, which are things like characters or strings, and production rules, which is a combination of per, uh, terminal symbols. Okay, and we're gonna go through this concretely very soon. And um, one of the key people here was Nicholas Wirt, who um, defined EBNF, okay? BNF was um, was the work of Bacchus and Now. Bacchus was a very famous, both of these guys, people were very famous people in programming languages. Um, and um, EBNF was uh, the, um, something produced by Nicholas Wirth, who's another amazing uh, computer scientist. Okay. <laughs> the Dragon Book. Someone in the, someone in the class knows about the Dragon Book. Good stuff. Um, so EBNF, we have very basic, if you know the Dragon Book, then this should be very easy. We're only, only scratching the surface in this lecture here, the very, very surface of what a grammar is. Okay. Um, so the very basic syntax of EBNF production rules. So the what we call the equal sign in English um, that defines what we call a production rule. The vertical bar defines alternatives. So if you say um, one, two, and three, the little quotes mean the symbol one, the symbol two, the symbol three, and the vertical bars mean it can be either of those alternates. So what we're seeing there is in this part of the grammar, you can either have a one, uh, the symbol one, you can have the symbol two, the symbol three. Notice these are just symbols. It doesn't mean numerically one or numerically two. It just means a symbol. Okay. It could be someone's name, it could be anything. It's just a symbol one, a symbol two, and a symbol three. The curly brace identifies expressions that occur zero or more times. So if we see the thing on the right there, it says one, within a comma means followed by, okay? Um, then it's got the symbol 
zero in curly braces. So can anyone tell me what um, <clears throat> what one what what, what this 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 um, expression here? Can anyone tell me some legal um, words, if you like, that uh, that that thing can define? Okay. So if I had the symbol just the one, that would be legal because a one followed by none of those. If I had um, one followed by a single zero, then that would um, be legal also. If I had one followed by two zeros, that would also be legal. If I had one followed by three zeros, that would also be legal. Okay. Notice that I say one followed by three zeros. I don't say 1000 because it doesn't have any particular meaning. It's just four symbols in a row. Yeah. And Linda said uh, that's like 1 million, but, it, but remember it has no meaning at all. It's just one followed by six zeros. It's not 1 million. Okay. Because these grammars don't tell you anything about what they mean. They just tell you about the organization of the symbols. Okay. And then uh, the square brackets identifies expressions that may occur zero or one time. So if we have one, uh, if we have this one here, um, then in that case, we can only have, um, yeah, with a one in front. Yeah. In that case, we can only have one followed by zero or one. They're the only two cases. You can't have multiple zeros in this one. Okay. So it's either zero or one if we've got the square brackets. Okay. So the difference between the curly brace, that means zero or many. This one here means zero or one. Okay. And then, um, the comma, as you've already seen, it means concatenation. So it means uh, the one followed by the zero and um, dash is used for, for exceptions. You can say a whole lot of stuff and, and say accepting and then call out an exception. Okay. So you, so um, that we'll see an example later where that, that might be quite useful. And you can use the curly brace, the curved braces, the parentheses like that to identify groups of stuff and um, you use a semicolon at the end of a production rule. Okay. So here's an example. This is straight out of Wikipedia and it's a grammar for a very strange, not very useful little language. Okay. Um, yeah, it does have something to do with regular expressions. Okay. So here we have a simple syntax for a, um, a very simple uh, language. Notice that it's defining a program. The, the first production will tells us what a whole program looks like in this strange language. Okay. In this, um, in this, what it says is that any program in our special language is going to consist of a terminal thing, which is P R O G R A M, right? Then some white space, then an identifier, then more white space, then B E G I N, right? Which we say begin followed by white space, followed by, um, zero or more of assignment, semicolon, white space, followed by end. Okay. That's what a program looks like in this language. And if you look further, you find out that um, each of these things is defined. Okay. So you see here, it says white space. Well, down here, it says what a white space is. And, um, and here it's defining it just in terms of uh, English language. Okay. So it's English language. And then we say all characters and then you can say all visible characters. So these are just loose definitions of what these things mean. We're not enumerating them formally. Okay. Um, but then here we go to, um, <clears throat> And you see here, lost my connection again. All right, you see here an alphabetical character um, follow uh, an identifier is an alphabetical follow character followed by um, zero or more of alphabetical characters and digits. What's the, how would we describe that identifier in English? What's an English way of saying what that rule means? What it means is that identifiers can have digits and alphabetical characters, but they must start with an alphabetical character and there must be at least one of them. Okay. That's what it says. That's a way of interpreting what that says. Okay. It says there must be at least one, which is an alphabetical character. The alphabetical character must be at the start. Then after that, you can have a mix of alphabetical characters and digits, and you can have any number of those. Okay. A number is going to have, um, optionally the square brackets means it's either there or it isn't zero or one dash, which is of course we think of, of a negative sign, a followed by a digit, followed by some number of digits. It's a very strange, what's, what's weird about this definition of number? Anyone know what's weird about this? There's something pretty obviously weird about it. Anyone what's weird about this definition of number? There's something kind of a bit broken about it. Oops. Well, it's kind of broken. It's, it allows you to do things that are a bit strange, like having a minus zero. 
for example. It's not a very sophisticated notion of number. And also that notion of number is only dealing with uh, integers. It doesn't let you have a decimal place in it. Okay, so it's a very simplistic notion of number. Then you've got a string. And a string must start with a double quote. And then it's got all characters with the exception of a double quote. So that's where we're using the exception of thing. Okay, yeah, so you're exactly right. You can do minus zero with a strange number. Um, so here we've got a string is a double quote followed by any number of these things where these things can be any character you like except for a double quote. Okay, and then um, an assignment in this language, oops, I keep clicking the mouse, an assignment is going to be an identifier followed by this particular symbol here, which as someone pointed out is, is what, what Pascal, uh, language of Pascal used, uh, followed by a number or an identifier or a string. And notice that number is defined here. Identifier is defined here and string is defined here. Okay. And then we talked up here about an alphabetic character and that's defined here and simply defined as being an A or a B or a C or a D or an E, etc. all the way up to Z. Notice that there's no lowercase in this strange language. It's not everything's an uppercase. And then you've got the digits, which is all 10 digits, uh, decimal digits, white space, and all characters is just everything else. And now let's, let's look at our little program here. This is a very strange program. So you've got the, the word program at the start, then you've got some white space, then you've got an identifier, and it's got to follow this rule here, alphabetical followed by some number of alphabetical characters or digits. So you've got demo one. Then you've got to follow that by begin, which you see here, uh, then some white space, and then you've got, um, what's this thing here? This has got the semicolon, it's one of these things. It's an assignment, which is an identifier, followed by one of these things, followed by a number identifier or string. In this case here, it is a number. Notice there's no white space in this. That's just what the grammar says. Okay, so you've got to have this identifier followed by a colon, followed by an equal, and then followed by, in this case, a number and terminate with a semicolon. Um, where is it? Assignment. Yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't. Uh, yes. So assignments are followed by semicolons up there. It tells you up here. Okay. And then you've got more white space and so forth. And it keeps doing this. Notice the curly brackets means you can have zero or more of these. So you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and then ultimately it's followed by this END. All right, so that's an example of an EBF grammar. Um, uh, the grammar is there. Now, if I put one of these in the exam, I will provide you with that information there. So you don't need to memorize. You don't need to memorize this. You need to understand it, but you don't need to memorize it. And you'll see in the sample exam, there is there is at least one question in the sample exam that uses an EBF grammar. Okay, so let's now, I'm going to put this on the sl slide here and I want people in the chat to make suggestions for writing a grammar for um, for natural numbers. Remember, this doesn't have any meaning. It's just the way natural numbers get printed. By natural numbers, we mean non-negative um, integers. Um, for integers, which can have negatives. For decimal numbers, so that's um, something with a decimal place in it. And um, finally, a 24-hour time on a digital clock, which is going to be, you know, what a 24-hour time looks like on a digital clock. It'll have... Um, one or two digits followed by a colon followed by two digits. Okay, so on the chat, try and make suggestions about what these could be. I'm going to start going through natural numbers. And if you've got ideas for the others, you can type them into the chat and we'll move through these. Okay, first of all, natural numbers. Um, now, I've made a suggestion here. The way you can define a natural number is either the zero or a non-zero digit followed by a digit. Now, why did I do that? Can anyone see why? Can anyone work out why I did that? Yeah, um, someone someone pointed out previously, I think with respect to the other grammar, this one, that this number here allows you to have a zero as a leading digit, which is really weird, right? So someone else pointed out there could be a negative zero. That's also weird. But even weirder is that you could have like, um, 005 as a number, which is not the way we normally write, um, not the way we normally write numbers. Okay. Now what I've done in this example here is I've excluded that possibility. So you can either have the number zero because it's actually the number zero, or if you're going to have any other natural number, it's got to start with a non-zero digit. And after that, it can have any digit. Okay. So a non-zero digit is all these things and a digit is a zero or a non-zero digit. There are different ways you could write this. You could have just said, a digit is all those things and a non-zero digit is a digit with the exception of zero. You could equal, just as equally have done that. That would also be legitimate. All right, so how are we going to write integers? Okay, so this is natural numbers. Now we want to write integers, which are going to have minus signs in, in them. Any suggestions? I'm looking for people to write stuff on the chat. 
What about decimal numbers? Okay, so we've got to write a grammar that uh, um, co is consistent with the way we write the characters for um, natural numbers, for integers, decimal numbers, and a 24 hour time in a digital clock. Okay, so well, okay, so I've still got no suggestions there. So what do we have to think about with an integer? What we have to think about there is, okay, here we go, great. Someone said integers. Um, we have either a zero or a um, optionally a minus sign in front of a non-zero digit followed by digit with the same definitions up there. That looks pretty good to me. The main thing that's interesting about that is it makes sure that the minus sign doesn't go in front of a zero because minus zero, as someone else has already pointed out, is not the way we normally think of zero. So, um, and <laughs> it looks like, oh, the only difference is, um, yeah, so there's a small error. There's a small error in that answer. Can you see what the small error is in the answer on the chat? There's one error there. Um, there's there's the, the 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 two things that are, the thing on my screen and the thing on the chat are almost identical. The only difference is that yeah exactly Nathan's pointed out that I've I've got here the curly braces and on the chat um, we had the square braces and the square braces mean that you can only either have um, one digit or zero digits here. So you, you do need the curly braces. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then for uh, decimal numbers. Okay. So decimal numbers is where you've got the um, the dot in there. Can anyone think about that? That's that's going to be much harder, right? Because now you've got to, well, it's going to be somewhat harder at least. Okay. So now you've got to deal with all those issues we just talked about. Plus you've got to have a, 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 a decimal place in there. Okay. All right. Well, I'll let you think about it for a moment longer. Oh, here we go. Um, time and digit. We've got time is okay. We've got 24 hour time. I'll come to that in a minute. Okay. Anyone got the um, decimal number? Okay, so our decimal number is going to look like this. <clears throat> it's going to have a minus sign um, for, um, concatenated with a natural number. Okay. Um, um, followed by, optionally, a um, dot followed by a digit followed by non-zero digit. Okay, because we don't want trailing zeros. That's why we've got the non-zero digit here. And then we've got some number of digits and we've got a non-zero digit at the last digit after the decimal place. Okay. So after the decimal place, we've got to have a non-zero digit as the last of the rightmost thing. Okay. And the square bracket means that there may not be a decimal place at all. If we don't have a decimal place, then in fact, the decimal number looks just like a, an integer. Okay. Okay. And then um, we get all this stuff here and then we've got this, this exclusion at the end that says we don't want, we're going to discount the minus zero, which we could have written this the same way. Okay, so we said we'll exclude the case of the minus zero. And what else we've got here? Okay, so um, with respect to the one above, um, so someone's, someone, Adam's made a suggestion for 24 hour time, and someone's pointed out that, that the 24 hour time that he's got would allow you to say 29, for example, which is um, you can't have 29. So what have I done here? I've written it this way. And slightly more complicated. I've said that the time is going to be an hour followed by a minute. Okay. With a colon in between. And then an hour is going to be a zero one, um, uh, followed by a digit. Okay. Certainly on some digital clocks, they, they always put the zero there. Um, well, maybe, or maybe not. You could have, you could have nothing, I guess, if you didn't want the, the zero. Oops. Zero one followed by a digit. Um, or it's going to have a two followed by those things, which gets around the problem that got raised on the chat about having 29. So I've done a special case here for the two. So you, you've either got a zero followed by a digit or a one followed by a digit, or you've got um, a two followed by either zero, one, two, or three. Okay. And then you've got in minutes, you've got um, uh, up to five followed by any digit. Okay. Cause you can't have a 60. All right. So I think that's right. Um, and with that, we're done. Um, hang on, do we need to define digit? Digit, digit. Yeah, now you, you do need to define digit, but I'd already defined it on this on this page here. So just to save space, I didn't redefine it. Okay. So I likewise here, I, I, NZ di digit was up here. Okay. So this digit, that digit up there. Okay. So if you did this in exam or whatever, you'd have to write the digit out somewhere. But in this case here, I've, I'm just reusing stuff that I've written up there. Um, 
All right. Um, I, with that, I think we're done. And we can go on to the mini quiz for the grammars. And publish the poll. There's a mini quiz. And we're on time and ready to do the bio. So let's do the bio. Um, Robin Milner, one of my favorite people. In fact, um, maybe next year, if you come see my office in the on campus, um, which you can't do right now because I'm not even in my office, but if you came to see my office, you'd see right next to my office, there's a meeting room. And it's called the Robin Milner Room. And that very photograph there on the slide is um, on the wall of a meeting room. And there's a reason for this, and that, that's that Robin had a long connection with our department through um, one of my former colleagues who's now retired, I call Malcolm Newey, and they were both in the same lab together. And the lab they were in actually was McCarthy's lab, the famous McCarthy, the McCarthy who's famous for garbage collection and famous for um, artificial intelligence. That's what he's most famous for. So Robin and, um, and Malcolm were in the lab together, and Robin went on and became extremely famous um, um, for his amazing contributions to computer science. And in fact, at the bottom of that photograph I have, I've got the actual Turing Award citation, and it's one of the longest citations for a Turing Award that I've seen. And it's because he made so many different contributions. Um, one of the areas that he worked on um, was an automatic theorem proving, which is incredibly important. He developed the thing called LCF, which is the first human assistive theorem prover. And sitting a couple of doors down from me is, um, sorry, sitting right next door to me in the new, in the building is um, Michael Norrish, who's a colleague of mine from uh, Data61 from CSIRO, and he works on automated theorem proving. And his the work he does is a legacy of Robin Milner, and he maintains a thing called Hole, which is one of the um, key automatic um, uh, human system theorem provers. And that's a legacy of Robin Milner. Um, Robin also developed uh, ML, which uh, stands for meta language, which is an early non-pure functional language. And for those of you who are interested in such things, Malcolm, who is a friend of Robin's, had an honor student at ANU called Don Syme, who is now famous for being the father of F Sharp. And F Sharp is a .NET language um, that's very widely used, and it's a very important language. And it um, is a descendant of ML. It's a, it's a cousin of ML. And Milner was also famous for um, the Pi calculus. So, um, so he was, um, which is a mathematical formalism for describing properties of concurrent computation. This is allowing us to reason about the correctness of things of concurrent computation, which is extremely difficult. And he was an incredibly modest guy. Um, he, when I was a PhD student, he used to come to ANU and uh, I had... Um, uh, tea with him plenty of times or coffee with him plenty of times and I never knew he was a Turing Award winner. <laughs> he never he never even said that. So um, funny story, a quick, we're about to go. You can leave if you, if you want to leave, but I'll just give you a quick anecdote. So a colleague of mine um, did his, um, was very, very excited to um, be admitted into Cambridge uh, to do a PhD. Uh, he's from another country. He um, was from a country that didn't have a strong computer science um, academia. And he was extremely excited because in his final year as an undergraduate, he actually got a paper accepted in a, a conference. It was a very obscure conference in a, an obscure place, but he was nonetheless extremely proud of this. And it was obviously good enough to get him a PhD at Cambridge. Anyway, he, he shows up at Cambridge and he's walking around the grounds um, where the computer science uh, building is and so forth on a weekend and just checking everything out. Cause then he's just incredibly filled with excitement. He's come from um, an Eastern European country and it's just, it's just a huge thing to be able to go to Cambridge. Anyway, he's there and he sees this gardener there and he's uh, chatting with this gardener and, uh, uh, and the gardener's very friendly and it's on a Sunday. Um, and uh, anyway, the gardener turns out has an office. Well, it's not really a gardener. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the um, and he invites him into his office and, uh, and asks him what he does. And he says, oh, well, you know, I've just started here. Um, and, I'm, and, and I've actually, did you know, I've actually got a paper. I've published a paper. It's at this obscure conference that, 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 um, in, the, in the US. And um, I'm very, very proud of it. And, um, and then he says, to, um, he says to the gardener, so what do you do? And, um, or, or, sorry, he says to him, what was the last thing you published? And, he, and then uh, it turns out the gardener, of course, is Robin Milner. And Robin says, um, actually, I haven't published very much since I won the Turing Award. So my poor friend had no idea he was talking to the very, very famous Robin Milner and actually thought he was just a gardener. But that was the kind of guy Robin was. Sadly, he died relatively young. 
and uh, he was an enormous contributor to computer science and, and, uh, and a, a thoroughly decent person. He had a big influence over a number of people who I know very well. So with that, I'll finish up. Uh, that's the end of the lecture. We're right on 12. And don't forget, we've got another lecture on Friday, which will be the last bit of content for the course. Don't forget to go and look at the uh, the Piazza post that I did for this week, which has appointed to the um, uh, exam, uh, the, the, the um, last, year, last semester's exam, and also gives details about how this semester's exam is going to work. Um, have a good week and um, I'll catch you on Friday.